Well, thanks everybody for coming to our event on Science Week. I guess this is the event to kick off the start of Science Week. So what we wanted to do for this event was to just have a research panel. Uh, we wanted to get people from individual departments, faculty members, and some students uh, so that they could talk about different ways that, that undergraduates can get involved with, with the whole research process here at Utah State. So this is mostly gonna be a question and answer format. We're gonna have all of our panelists We'll just go in order and they'll just tell them, tell us a little bit about themselves, uh, some of what they're studying uh, or what they're researching, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions after that. So as far as the order, we'll have Dr. Freeman first, then Dr. Hevel, then Amelia Ashby, then Dr. Brown wrapped up with Skady Kobe. So we'll go ahead and turn time over to you, I suppose, Dr. Freeman. Great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for including me in this uh, kickoff event for Science Week. I am a second year assistant professor in biology. I study the brain. Um, I suppose I'll give you a little bit of my career background since I feel like some days it hasn't been that long since I was sitting as an undergraduate at my uh, institution, but um, I got my bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Virginia. I did undergraduate research when I was an undergrad. I actually studied biological rhythms. So I worked in a fruit fly lab and we studied circadian clock genes. And then I went on and got my PhD at Emory University in neuroscience where I studied social behavior, which I continue to study today. So at USU, I am still setting up my lab. I've got a lot of stuff working and moving and grooving, but I still feel very new. Um, I have 11 undergraduates that work for me, two master's students, a postdoc. I think that's everybody. <laughs> so trying to get some things off the ground to better understand the mechanisms that underlie social attachment in both humans and in animals. And the way that we study social attachment in animals is to study monogamous animals. So I have started um, working with the coyotes at the Millville Predator Center, just about, what, 10 minutes south of campus. Um, coyotes form monogamous long-term pair bonds, something a lot of people don't know about. So I do a whole variety of techniques that involve working with live animals, looking at their behavior, working with uh, hormone levels and studying or manipulating the hormones of an animal. And most of the work I do in the lab involves uh, preparing, sectioning, studying, and microscopically analyzing brain tissue. Happy to be here. Thank you. Then we'll have Dr. Hevel next. Hi, I'm Dr. Joni Hevel. I'm an associate professor in chemistry and biochemistry. Um, in terms of my background, I got my bachelor's of science in chemistry at a very small liberal arts school on the East Coast called Lebanon Valley College. I then got my PhD in medicinal chemistry at uh, the University of Michigan, and I did a postdoc at UC Berkeley. I happened to meet the guy that I was going to marry, and so I followed him around for a little while. I did a postdoc at the University of Hawaii and one at um, University of South Alabama before arriving to um, Utah State University. Um, my research lab, I would describe myself as a protein mechanic. Uh, I love proteins. I love uh, figuring out how they work, why they don't work sometimes. Um, we study a particular class of proteins that are present in humans. And when they function properly, uh, embryogenesis works, your immune response works, you have good cardiovascular health. And when these enzymes don't work well, then you have cancer, you have cardiovascular issues, uh, your immune system doesn't work, basically everything works in the reverse. So um, my lab has been interested for, I've been here since 2003. So unlike Dr. Freeman, I'm a moldy oldie. Um, and um, we are interested in all things related to understanding how this protein functions in humans. Fantastic, thank you. Then we'll have Amelia Ashby. 
Yeah, hi, my name is Amelia. Um, I am the student assistant for the Office of Research. Um, and I primarily work on all things undergraduate research. Um, so I help students find opportunities and coach them through how to find a mentor and how to get involved. Um, and I also help coordinate different research fellowships, different grant opportunities, as well as um, presentation opportunities. So I can kind of help out literally at any stage along the way. Um, this is my senior year. I'm actually graduating this semester, which I'm really excited about. Um, and I am a psychology major. And in doing that, I've also been really involved in research as well. Um, I have been involved in everything from like annual animal behavioral research to studying new statistical methods to use to studying implicit measures of math anxiety. Um, and now I'm currently a support coach uh, for the new ACT guide, if you guys have heard of that. so. Basically, what I do nowadays is coach kids through the ACT Guide, and we study um, how that helps keep kids in the program and stuff like that. So I am super passionate about research. I'm really passionate about the fact that I think research can be for everybody, and everybody can find something that fits them in a really important and life-changing kind of way sometimes. The only reason I became a psychology major was because of the research that I got involved with. So it's something that I care about a lot. I'm really glad that Alex, you invited um, our office to join in. I think that this is a really important step of an undergraduate career that sometimes people miss out on. So thank you so much for inviting us. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate that as well. So we'll go ahead and turn over some time to Dr. Brown with Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm a professor in the math and stat department, uh, happen to be the associate department head, um, which means I have far less time for doing research than I would like, but nevertheless, I still give it a shot. Um, my, I don't have a research program per se. Um, I've done research in all manner of discrete mathematics. Uh, that includes just broadly speaking, combinatorics, number theory, um, I've done some work with strange matrix ranks and linear algebra. Uh, I work with partially ordered sets. Um, I've worked with uh, the concept of entropy being redefined for all kinds of different, different places. Um, uh, not the thermodynamic entropy, but more the information entropy. Um, I, I guess I'm willing to entertain any kind of research project as long as um, I don't know, I guess I don't really have a constraint. I, I haven't turned anyone down who has come to me and said, hey, I want to do a project on whatever, unless I simply know that I will not have time to catch up with them. Um, and, and maybe even then, I, I've, I have found that it's pretty much okay to just be a cheerleader. You can ask Jonathan about this. He's, he's working with me on some projects right now, and I'm, I'm basically a cheerleader and not a very good one at that. Like, I don't even have palm pie. I don't, I don't throw people around or anything like that. I just kind of every once in a while I say way to go. But um, I can't think of a, an example. Oh yeah, I can. Okay, so here's, here's an example that um, I guess is kind of a paradigm for some of the research I've done on partially ordered sets. And, and maybe you could find something that, that seems interesting, um, at least the, the rest of the people that, are, that have talked about their research. So if you take a cup of coffee and you add a granule of sugar to it, and then another granule, and then another granule, and then another granule, and you taste these cups of coffee at each step where you add this granule of sugar, uh, you're not gonna notice a difference between them. So there's a continuum of coffee flavors from one granule to, I don't know what a reasonable number of granules would be where the cup is overflowing and practically nothing but sugar. Let's just say a million. So somewhere there's a, there's a point at which you're going to be able to tell the difference between this cup of coffee and this cup of coffee. That turns out to insta to kind of, um, I guess, create a partial order on your preference relations between your um, coffee sweetness. So I've, I've created mathematical models that, that work for that. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's maybe the easiest example I can think of that doesn't that doesn't get terribly technical. Um, and that's probably more than two minutes, so I'll I'll stop there and th say thanks again. Thank you. I know I personally would love to hear more about that at some point. That's something I'm horribly undereducated in, so that sounds fascinating. Coffee and sweetness, or a uh... both, both, <laughs> absolutely. Coffee, sweetness, and math. I could definitely use a lesson in all of them. So yeah, thank you very much.
then we'll wrap up. Our last panelist is Skady Kobe. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Skady. I am here from the geosciences department. Um, I'm a geology major and I'm an undergrad. This is my senior year, so I'll graduate in April slash May, um, whenever graduation actually is. Um, I started in research in April, 2019. I had one of my faculty members approach me um, after being in one of her classes and asked if I wanted to join her research group. Um, and we have been focusing on a mountain range up in Northern Utah called the Albion Raft River and Grouse Creek Range. Um, and the big scope of our project is to get samples of rocks there that are very, very old and get exact age ranges on those and then get additional isotopic values to figure out exactly what depth in the mantle that those rocks came from. Um, and to do that has been, it was supposed to be a one semester project and is now uh, a year and a half long project and COVID definitely had um, a big part of that. So uh, yeah, that, that's a whole other story. I don't know, maybe we'll get into that at some point when we talk about how COVID has influenced research this year. Um, but yeah, so I've been working with um, a couple of people at Utah State and then we have a, an additional research team at Weber State University. Um, and I also had the opportunity to train in a mineral separation lab at Idaho State University. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a big experience and I've met a lot of really interesting people. Um, and I also, I think Amelia, I've had an opportunity to work with you. It was a while ago, but I did apply for the ERCO grant last year. Um, so that's how I've been funding my research. Well, excellent. Thanks. Thank you, Skady. Thanks everybody who gave an introduction. I think what we're going to do now, we'll just open the time up to any questions. So if you're in the audience and you do have any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat, we'll monitor the chat, or just go ahead and unmute yourself and say them. If you would like to direct them toward the specific person, please say so, that'll make it a little bit easier to respond. And if it is just a general question, we can just leave it open and, and anybody will be, be able to answer. So we'll turn over some time to that now, thank you. So it looks like we have a question in the chat. I'll go ahead, like I said, and just read those. So it says to everyone, what is the best way to approach a faculty member if you're just getting started? Well, pre-COVID, I would say go knock on their door. <laughs> um, given, given the conditions, write them a professional email. Yeah, that's kind of what we tell our students if we have a student come to us and ask us that question. Um, first, research what they're researching a little bit. Look into what projects they're working on, whether or not it actually interests you. Because a lot of times students don't do that extra step and then they get there and they're like, oh, I actually don't care about any of this and I feel really overwhelmed. So <laughs> definitely make sure that you know what's going on with their research. Um, and then if you really are interested, just shoot them an email. Um, oftentimes they'll and be immediately excited um, and they'll set up a time with you or they'll say, hey, here's a grad student you should talk to instead or something like that. So an email is definitely the best way to go in my book. Yeah, I can hop onto that too. I, I get a lot of emails from undergrads now. It's wonderful and I love it. Um, there are definitely good and bad ways to do it though. And I don't wanna say bad that they're like, there's some sort of mistake that you can make, but there's definitely a lack of information that I think Amelia just highlighted. Um, you should definitely know what they're working on at least a little bit and mention it. I don't know how many emails I've gotten that just said, hi, I wanna do research, thanks, you know? <laughs> And it's fine. It's like, thank you for your interest and enthusiasm. Tell me more about yourself. I mean, maybe some other faculty would just not respond, but it's you, there should be an, a balance between too little and too much. I don't, if there's more than a paragraph or two, I might, oh, I don't have time to read this right now. I'll read it later. And then more emails come in and then your 
very lengthy introduction email might end up at the bottom of my inbox and I can't see it anymore and then it gets forgotten. So there's definitely a sweet spot between, you know, telling me a little bit about why you're interested and why you emailed me in the first place and putting so much of your life story in the email about every class you've taken that's relevant to potentially doing work in my lab that, you know, makes the, the sort of quick and easy response a little bit more of a time uh, commitment that might then risk the email getting overlooked. So definitely, definitely add a little bit of, you know, if you're a freshman or a junior or what major you're in, or, you know, if you, if you even know what kind of work I do and, and why you're excited about it, but not, you know, not overload. Marianne just put in the chat that they have a faculty interest page. And that's actually something that we use to find research opportunities for students as well. Um, Cause we don't have a, our office doesn't have a running list of all the projects that are going on. That would be literally insane <laughs> since they're constantly changing and, and, and multiplying tenfold. But um, we search through all of the online information that we have and faculty research pages are like the number one way that students find things. So I guess hot tip for faculty as well, make sure that page is updated. But like, that's a fantastic way to get their contact information, look at their CVs and, and see what um, projects they've done in the past. That's a good tip. I've, I've got sort of a counter question for everyone. Uh, so I, I happen to be the honors department advisor for the math and stat department. Um, and I think actually the, the College of Science writ large, but I don't know, anyway, point is I get, I get emails from students that they know they want to do or should be doing research for some reason or other. And um, while that's clearly very mercenary and slightly off-putting, I still get quite a bit of emails that are just like that. Like, I don't really care or know what I want to do, but I know I'm supposed to be doing research because of whatever. So maybe the subtext is they know it's going to help their CV or something like that. What kind of advice can you give to those students? Because I, I know what I tell them. I'm, I'm kind of wondering what anyone else would tell them. If you have someone that just kind of stumbles into your office, whether it be virtual or live, and says, hey, I, I, I want to do research. Don't really care what, just want to do it. I've had a few of those. And when I start talking to them about what I do, I usually never hear from them again. <laughs> so I guess that means they figured out they don't want to do neurobiology <laughs> or they don't like me as a person. I don't know. <laughs> so in chem biochem, we obviously have a lot of pre-med students and of course, medical schools are looking for their applicants to have undergraduate research. And there are, you know, I hate to put students in two different groups, but there are the pre-med students who simply want to check that box. They want to put down on their application that I've been in an undergraduate lab doing research. And then there are the students who really want to do undergraduate research. And um, for those students who are really just looking for a check in the box, uh, the biochemistry degree requires you to take a, it's a biochem lab called 5720. Uh, Alex has run through 5720. Uh, it is designed to actually give you a research-like experience. And so for many years now, uh, when Dr. Johnson ran it, and now when Dr. Dickinson is running it, uh, he has said that if you need that, if they, if they, if you need them to write a letter that says you've had an undergraduate research experience in this 5720 lab, uh, he will do that. And that actually works really well for a student who's only looking to check the box because quite frankly, um, to, to really get the most out of undergraduate research, you've got to invest. You've got to invest physically, you've got to invest mentally, um, if you're just going to kind of gloss through it and, and you're only going to spend a few hours here or there and you're only going to do it for one semester, you're really not going to get a whole lot out of it. So. 
I have a, a follow-up question as well um, to Skady, actually. Um, you were able to narrow down your research interests all the way to the point that you had like an actual ERCO project that you um, submitted for. How did you know what you wanted to research? How did you narrow those interests down? And how did you personally, like, I don't know, go through that journey? So I feel like I kind of had a little bit of a different experience and I think it's because the geosciences department is really small um, and so we don't have a kind of system set up for undergraduates to specifically go find research projects. It's kind of, we're working on it right now, but honestly, a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, so my mentor actually approached me. I had been in one of her classes in the previous semester um, and we kind of ran into each other in the department. She was basically just asked, hey, would you be interested in working on this project with me. I had no idea what it was. Um, I hadn't taken any of the classes necessary to understand it, which I didn't realize until this year when I took those classes and I was like, you guys, this makes sense finally. <laughs> um, so it's really just been kind of like a learning on the ground kind of thing. Um, she like gave me an overview of the project in one of our first meetings and then gave me like a handful of papers to read Kind of pointed me into the sections that I should read to try and understand it a little bit more. Um, and then we somehow built a whole proposal out of that. And I kind of just learned on the go. And that's how it's been going since last April is just, I'll read a paper here and there. It'll explain more. My classes make it make more sense. I talk to her more. I talk to our people at We Were State more. Um, and it's still going forward slowly. <laughs> I just got a question in the chat. Um, this one came to me privately. It said, what is the best way for new students, freshmen who do not have any experience or really any, any valuable experience working in a research lab to get involved? If they're just starting their career, they're maybe in like base level classes, how do they show faculty that they're invested? I, I'll, I'll just chime in. I, I'm not opposed to taking freshmen. Um, a lot of the work I do, it's, I mean, it's technical skill building that I think anybody really has the potential to do. And the, the hands-on work that you get teaches you a lot about the brain's anatomy and kind of basic organizational and planning and time management skills. And so I think, I mean, this is probably not for every faculty member. So I think if there's someone starting out who's early you know just arrived the the at least for me the the hard part about getting them into the lab is that I have that my lab's full already and so I, I usually end up saying you know take a relevant class this year check back with me next year you know go you know if you're interested in neuroscience and you or you think you're interested in neuroscience take the prereqs get through this year focus on your coursework you know get good grades and then check in with me again at the end of the year or in the summer and we'll, you know, we'll try to work it out then. But if I had space and I had a freshman, especially who might have done, um, you know, maybe worked with animals before, like volunteered in a vet clinic or who, um, I don't know, was really interested in science in high school, maybe participated in science fairs and such things like that, who can you know, show me that they think critically and that they're really curious, like just having that kind of intrinsic curiosity is, I think, step one. And a lot of students come in with that. And I don't really know how you can assess it um, without just meeting them and talking to them and seeing how excited they get about science. But I don't necessarily think that being a freshman is, um, you know, something that would prevent you from getting involved in research. I just think a lot of the labs that do a lot of work with undergrads are often, you know, full already with juniors and seniors. And so they, they, there's some patience involved with kind of finding the right spot. And if they go on to take the right classes and figure out that maybe they want to work with somebody else, you know, great. I, I hope I, you know, help them navigate at least, you know, semester one or two in their careers. Yeah, I think that's something that, that, undergraduates don't realize that the room that we have in our research lab is, is kind of rolling. Uh, I might have two or three students that have just started and know nothing. And so they need a heck of a lot of supervision. 
I can't risk taking another student right now, especially not a freshman. But three months from now, depending on how invested those first two students are, they may be up and running. And I might be able to now take somebody. So I tell students to be professionally persistent, right? So uh, knock, knock, knock. I'm really interested in your research. Uh, I would love to talk to you about volunteering in your lab. I don't have space. Okay, two weeks from now, knock, knock, knock. Hi, I'm back again. I just wanted to check in, say hi. Just wanted you to see my face. I'm still really interested in working in your lab. I know you don't have room right now. Have a great day, right? Month goes by, knock, knock, knock. <laughs> Because there's so many of you, I mean, we, we lose track of the face and the name, and you got to be professionally persistent. Get your name and your face in there, uh, or at, now in, in the time of COVID, uh, an email. Uh, don't be annoying, um, but professionally persistent. Uh, I take freshmen in my lab too. In fact, probably four of the most successful people I've had come out of my lab. One got her PhD at Duke, another got his PhD at UCLA. Uh, another one uh, is getting his PhD in the department here. The other one went on get, to get a, uh, a MBA at the Huntsman uh, Business School and she's now an equity finance uh, uh, person for Goldman Sachs. So, yeah, I take freshmen. I, they, they require more work. They require more supervision. Um, but you have them for four years. I want to add that um, our office actually, every semester, we try to have four professional development workshops for undergraduate researchers who want to get started but don't really know how. Um, and those things can run from how to get involved with a faculty mentor or First of all, what does research even look like in my field? Um, or how to create a CV, like all of these things that are really important to research that freshmen or beginning students might just not even know how to ask or know what to ask. Um, so if any student is interested in doing any of those workshops, I would suggest signing up for our email list to at least know what opportunities are out there for early professional development. Yeah, that's a good point. There are also um, like classes and, um, you know, yeah, training opportunities. Like I know in the biology department, there's two classes, um, biology professions and pre-health professions. I can't remember the course titles. I think it's like 1050 and 1060. Uh, and I'm, I mean, seniors can take them too. I think they might be required. I, again, I'm only in my second year. So, uh, I don't know all of the re curriculum requirements for biology majors, but um, I know that there's there are a lot of students in these classes and there are uh, guest speakers that come like I've I've been a guest speaker in a couple of these classes where you get to meet a lot of the faculty in your department and hear about their research and their career track and how they got to that point and and just learn about the work that's happening in the department that you might be considering declaring a major in. And so there's ways in your first year, if you're entering college to, maybe you don't join a lab yet, but you can start to, you know, kind of survey the scene, get involved in the Office of Research events that Amelia was talking about, um, attend some of the poster sessions that are happening throughout the year and see what your peers that are a year ahead of you or a few years ahead of you are doing and, and you know, find out what lab they worked in and how they got involved. So, you know, if you if you try to get involved early and you don't find any opportunities for whatever reason that may be, there's still ways to be productive and prepare yourself once you do finally find the right fit or find space in the lab that you've been persistent, professionally persistent in pursuing. I like that phrase, Joni. <laughs> Uh, may I add something to this? I, I hope it's adding something to the conversation, but can I speak <laughs> or is there another? Okay, so um, uh, and maybe this is most useful for Amelia because my I have a colleague that uh, um, he and I typically run um, undergraduate research 
things. Um, first of all, we, we vertically integrate them always. So if I have any graduate students, then they're probably involved to some extent. And we have two different paradigms for operating these things. One of them doesn't work, but yet we still run it this way. And I don't know why, but one is like students show up and you try and um, get them to talk about or tell you what they're interested in. And then you try and you try and meet them somewhere in the middle, their interest, your interest, and then you run with that. That doesn't work. I mean, just out of my data set, it never works. What does work is you have some specific problem and you, you tell your group, this is the problem, we're all going to solve it, we're all going to work on it. If it results in a publication, we will all be on that publication. And that, that way works. And uh, just for an example, the, one of the most recent publications I've had is with, was with uh, two, no, three other uh, undergraduate students. Uh, it took three years for the paper to appear. So like starting when you're a freshman, that's not a problem. So it might take three years before the results are written up, you send it to referees, they process and it comes back. Sometimes it takes nearly a year for a referee to get a math paper back. And that's just the way it goes. But in the meantime, you have the ability to say you've got a, you've got a paper submitted and you've done research and so on. But that, that, that paradigm where we get a bunch of people who are just interested in doing research together and say, this is the problem we're gonna work on. And then people start working. And I think for the paper that I just mentioned that has, has five authors on it, me is one of them, my colleague is another, uh, we started with a group of eight, I think. And then just kind of as things went, students started to realize like, I'm not contributing to this. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm out. But you know, I could, they still had a research experience and I could still write them very valuable letters of recommendation that talked about how they worked and what they contributed. And of course, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mention the fact that they didn't end up on the paper. You know I mean, I just talk about what they did and they, they had a research experience and they either didn't have time or you know, their talents didn't align or whatever. But that paradigm works. So Amelia, if you've got people that are interested in doing math research, uh, tell them that. Tell them don't go with some interest. Like just go read the writing on the wall and don't necessarily look to see. So maybe this advice is contrary to what's been given. Don't focus on what you're interested in and try and align it with a faculty member. You might want to look and see which faculty members have the most success at undergraduate research and then go with them. Uh, I took that route for my, my PhD program, and I think it was the smartest thing that I did as far as that's concerned. Uh, my colleagues, my, my grad student colleagues took other ways. Um, and my, my phrase for what they did is now chasing rainbows. So they, they wanted to go for more esoteric kind of cool math that they just liked. And they took um, on average two more years to finish their PhD uh, than I did. Um, and I, I just decided, oh, there's, there's an advisor. He just had two students graduate last year. Uh, I'll go with that guy. And, and, it's, and it worked out pretty well. So yeah, so there's my, to summarize, um, don't necessarily look for someone that aligns with your interests. If, if you want to get involved in a research team, I think that's, that's great. You, you definitely should. because It is definitely maybe the best way to take advantage of all the opportunities that there are on a university campus. And then second, look for, look for the faculty member that seems to do um, a lot of it and, and go with them. And, you know, and that's, that is sometimes easy to see because she might have a CV online that will tell you, um, and that they usually highlight which, which, are, which co-authors are students. And so you can just look to see if they've been active publication-wise. In math, that's a little bit different. You might have to dig a little deeper because um, almost every student I've worked with has at least done a presentation at, at a professional or semi-professional conference. So, but, th but that information, you kind of have to look a little bit harder to find. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I, I, I really like that advice. And I think it's pretty relevant, especially when we're talking about freshmen, because I don't think freshmen know what their interests are yet quite often. They're not quite sure even what research looks like in their field. So making sure that they get a good mentor who cares about producing content and, and actually getting stuff done, a mentor who cares about the professional development of the student and cares about actually doing research versus just kind of like, I don't know, following whatever the student wants to do. I think that's a really good way of looking at it, especially if you are getting involved so early on, because um, you will learn things along the way. And then by the end of the project, you'll be like, okay, that was a great experience. That's what I want to do. Or that was okay. I want to move on to something new. You know, I, I, I agree. I like that you said that. 
I, I would say that that has been, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was gonna say that's been basically my experience of, I had absolutely no idea what the project was. And at this point, I understand a portion of the project, but it's not something that I'm going to be pursuing in like my future educational career. But like the experiences I've gotten, the different instruments I've been trained on, um, the collaborators that I've worked with, that's been the like, that's been the true benefit of actually working this project. As a freshman, there's no way I would have come up with a project on my own. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out two things. I, I think it's important for students to realize how quickly something gets published is really different between fields. Even in the biochemistry department, you have Dr. Johnson who does x-ray crystallography. He can work for three or four years before he gets his structure, before he's ready to publish. So that's one project for four years. And there are other individuals that can work for six or eight months and have something that's ready to publish. And I think as an undergraduate, yeah, it's, it's cool if you get your name on the paper. Um, kudos, great. But I think the, the most valuable experience is that you've actually done the undergraduate research. Because when it's time for me to write a recommendation letter for you, I can tell whoever's getting the letter, what are your critical thinking skills like? How do you handle roadblocks? Can you communicate um, well? Uh, can you communicate to different audiences? Um, do you work well in a team? How quickly do you pick up a new technique? And this brings me to my second, my other point, and that is, say you have this vision for your career. You want to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and you be want to be the one that's developing drugs that help people. Right? I hear that a lot. Does that mean you have to work in undergraduate research doing that same thing? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You could go work with somebody doing plant biochemistry or you, it, it, it really doesn't matter. As long as you're doing undergraduate research and you're using your brain and you're doing those, you're honing those critical thinking skills, you're, you're presented with a problem that you have to solve and you have to figure out how to solve it. Those are the things that your advisor, your mentor can write about that are going to get you into graduate school in order for you to have that job. That's the important thing. So. I had an additional question coming on the chat. Um, this one, the student asked, you know, how has research been affected during the pandemic? What ways, uh, what ways has COVID affected maybe your research in particular and as well your ability or your availability to bring new students into your lab, if at all, or if, yeah. Everything's slower. <laughs> and, um, I actually haven't brought anybody into the lab um, yet uh, for this semester. I've just been kind of holding off, um, trying to balance the need to keep my research program going and the risk that it poses to bring a whole bunch of new people in. Um, so I haven't taken anybody. That doesn't mean that um, I that emails from students to me wouldn't wouldn't go unnoticed um, as long as they're professionally persistent. <laughs> um, and in terms of being a mentor, um, I I have set days that I come into the lab. I run my group meeting by Zoom. Uh, every student has my cell phone number and they know that if an experiment is not going to get done because you don't have an answer, you don't know how to do something, you need to text me. Speaking from like 
the logistical side of things. Right now, the IRB isn't approving any in-person research at all. Um, so any project that goes through the IRB process isn't going to be approved. I think that goes for animal research as well. I'm not quite sure on that one. Um, but yeah, so no in-person ones are being done, but they will approve things that do account for social distancing or allow distance education and distance research. Um, I know personally, my research project is completely virtual uh, because I just coach students from afar over the phone and through text, which has been really nice. Um, but my other research project, I actually, it, all undergraduate students were kicked out of because it, we, they couldn't like, I don't know, have the capacity for that. So I think it's very much up to the principal investigators and whatever professors are working on that. It's kind of an individual basis, which kind of sucks, but I don't know, just for students, just keep trying and keep asking and seeing what's available. Um, some people will have the capacity, some won't. It's just kind of trial and error, unfortunately, right now, but. Amelia, do you want to tell the folks who don't know what the IRB is? Yeah, so so the IRB is the uh, Institutional Review Board. And whenever you have a, a project that deals with human subjects, um, there's also IACUC, which does research, uh, animal subjects and things like that. Uh, any Anytime you have projects dealing with a living thing, basically, besides like a plant, you kind of have to get it approved so that people aren't being inhumanely tested on and no one's going to die, basically. <laughs> they just want to make sure everyone is safe. Um, and so the IRB goes through all, all research proposals going through the university, um, including student proposals, grad student proposals, faculty proposals. Um, so they give you the big okay whether or not your project is ready to go. Um, so right now, if your project does include uh, in-person human research, and I think, and I think, the IO cook is doing the same. I'm not 100% positive on that. Um, then they'll ask you to hold it off until after restrictions have been lifted. I have something to add, but I can't not comment on Dr. Brown. What is Dave doing? <laughs> I mean, yeah, what, what, I, I would, if you have something to offer, I feel like you, you should speak before me. <laughs> I just felt like being a little ironic, putting my my lab gear on when when my lab basically you know consists of a whiteboard, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I, I I mean embarrassingly the the, the those sharpies that, can be dangerous. Yeah, well, <laughs> tell me about it, or, or that that the the dry erase marker. I'm sure I'm going to learn that something very adverse has happened to my fingertips in you know a handful of years from now, but but nevertheless, um, yeah. So I. I this is this was just a you know a, a parlor trick that I'd sometimes put on if uh, if I'm teaching a calculus one class and you know I was like okay we're gonna get really dirty today or whatever so I just put this on for for yucks but I I find it odd and a little irritating um, to to note that yeah my my lab has been slowed down considerably for the COVID apocalypse and and mostly it's just because of like the massive strain of of the 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 zeitgeist gumption that it's taken from everyone. I mean, there, there's no reason whatsoever that the the math parties that I used to host once to twice a week that consisted of anywhere from four to 12 undergraduate, graduate and faculty members getting together in one of our rooms in the, in the animal science building, which is AKA the math and stat building and just doing some math for however long we could tolerate it. And, and that's just not happening now. So um, just, I guess, and maybe it's just because there's less spontaneous or extemporaneous conversations in the hallways, but yeah, it's, it's, it's greatly and diminutively affected my lab, which is sad to say, but I, I guess I, I could be rallying and having uh, Zoom meetings because now we can do things like you know, we can have colloquia with, uh, you know, like superstars from across the, the nation that we don't have to pay to fly in or whatever. We can just say, yeah, fire up your Zoom and, you know, give a talk. Um, some of our student clubs are still very active. Um, the, you know, the attendance is slightly diminished, um, but, you know, they're still going. So I, I, have, I have no real appreciable reason for having a, a slowed down research program, uh, but it has. So, and that's, that's kind of unfortunate. Um, so I'm grateful that you're 
putting this kind of energy into um, undergraduate research because I mean the only way to like get it back to normal is to to put energy into it I think so it's going to take uh, it's going to take a while to recover I feel like you know um, given that we won't just flip a switch and go back to normal ever um, I can't expect that oh we'll just be doing those things we used to do so I assume there's going to be kind of a slow transition into whatever whatever kind of paradigm works so Anyway, I've said enough, but yeah, thanks for letting me show off my, my lab coat and uh, goggles and whatnot. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad that I called you out. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think in general, a lot of people probably could echo what um, Dave's dealing with, with the sort of, um, I don't know, the oomph is kind of missing like you you don't see each other in the hallways you don't run into colleagues and say you know oh you know this is my new grad student or oh, I just brought on this undergrad and get to introduce each other and and kind of talk shop or do shared lab meetings with other labs that do similar work as you and I think that's definitely happening across the board to labs and departments and universities all over um I feel very lucky because the main bit of work that I need the most help with that gets undergraduates involved in the research happening in my lab involves working on a specialized piece of equipment that only one person can do at a time with full PPE on. So all of the protective equipment that you have to use in order to protect yourself from infectious tissue and everything has to be sanitized when you're done. So I have been lucky and have been able to not only keep at least that aspect of my work going, but I've been able to bring on more students because it's just one person at a time and they're where, you know, they're protecting themselves, they're disinfecting the machine when it's, when it's done and I, my, my specimens are getting processed and projects will then come from the tissue that they're generating. So it's, it's worked out really nicely, I think for me. And I've been, I literally took on I think, I think I told myself I would take two new students this year and I took six. So I tried my best to max out my own capacity to be able to offer more spots to undergraduates that needed it, even if all they're doing is just, you know, all they're doing, uh, learning a technical skill. <laughs> but all they're doing is preparing tissue that we will use in later experiments that I, you know, we have to kick the can down the road for that. So yes, COVID has definitely affected the, the overall, you know, connectedness. I, I have to, I have two of my undergraduates in this meeting right now. And I have to say, I really miss this, the camaraderie and kind of sense of community that we built last year by having weekly lab meetings in person. I mean, I would come into the room and everybody would be chit chatting. Some of them are in class together and complaining about the exam last week or whatnot. And, you know, laughing about what's going on, talking about the next hockey game, you know, go USU like, and, and it was fun. And it was nice to walk into that and feel like we all had the sense of community and zoom is a big band aid, but it's not the same. And I have all of these new students and I'm doing my best to try to give them an opportunity to get involved. But I feel like, there's just this disconnect. And so I, I wish there was a way that I, we could just like blow energy back into it and kind of, you know, renew everybody's spirit. But um, I at least feel very lucky that I, I can offer something, even though I do agree, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be that same level of, you know, let's sit around and talk shop and be colleagues, you know. Yeah, I guess I would say I don't really have the faculty perspective on this because I'm not in charge of a lab at all. So all I can really speak to is how this has affected my like personal project and kind of our project or larger project. Um, and really the biggest thing was we're, we're basically just on a six month delay at this point. Um, we were supposed to go down to the University of Arizona to use a facility down there in April of course, right, as everything shut down. Um, so we ended up, we were able to use that facility, but we had to do it remotely. Um, and it was only at the beginning of October that we were able to process those samples. Um, so I'm barely starting to get data back on the samples I collected like in like October of 2019, I guess. Um, so that's been the, like the biggest impact of COVID for us, in addition to not being able to like physically meet with the rest of our uh, research group, but we were state and go out into the field to collect samples again. Um, 
with just kind of social distancing, safety precautions and everything, we just haven't been able to do anything like that. From, from the student's perspective, I'm curious about classes. And um, so my perspective, as far as teaching is concerned, uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm putting anywhere between two to five times as much effort into a class as I used to be putting into. And that, that's simply, that's taking away creative energy and gumption. And I'm sure all faculty are experiencing that. So I'm kind of curious about students. Is, is the learning process, is that different? Is that taking more time or less time? Or, you know, I, I worry about how flexible people's schedules can now become because you can literally be in two Zoom meetings at once or, or almost. And, you know, given that you have the potential to have like nowhere to be all day long, you just kind of roll out of bed and watch a video that might be pre-recorded or, or whatever. Um, there's some irony in that. I think that, you know, it kind of inhibits productivity having, having that free of a schedule. But anyway, so it, any, any, if any students can give insight to that, I'd, I'd like to hear it. I would say this semester has been just so rough with that. Like I, I recognize that my professors and I work in the geology office too. So I kind of have a little bit of a background. Like I work with the faculty members a lot preparing these classes, especially over this last summer. Um, so I, I've seen how many hours people are putting into trying to prepare to support their students through this insane semester. But from the student side of it, it is unreal. Like the amount of time I have to put into just making sure I'm in the right place at the right time is, it feels like it's like an additional one credits worth of time that I'm committing to just make sure I'm like, am I supposed to be in the field right now? Do I have my six hours of lab this week or are we just online? It is so hard to keep track of. And I, I don't know if it's just like upper division classes. Cause like the, I'm in one intro class right now. And that one is very, very straightforward. Like the professor has done an A plus job of making sure we know exactly if we're supposed to be in a broadcast lecture or if it's just virtual or sorry, video lectures kind of stuff. Um, but my geology classes are rough right now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm in psychology, so uh, obviously not science, but so it's a little different. But like in past semesters, I'd say that I have like one essay a week. Nowadays, I have like five or six essays due every week. Like, I feel like a lot of times it's just gone straight from, oh, we can't discuss this. How about you just write a paper instead? Which is nice. I like writing papers okay, but also that takes up so much time. So I don't know. And like, I don't know, I, I have a lot less time than I think I do when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, I've got all day to finish the four tasks I have to do. And then all of a sudden it's five o'clock and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got only like two things done. Like it just gets away from you so much quicker again, like when you don't have that framework to build around. It's, it, you have to be super good at time management, which is scary. I think that one, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a skill you have to learn for sure. <laughs> And I guess one more thing I wanted to add on to that, um, not being in class, I think um, some of the things I've advanced the most in have, or like the subjects I've advanced the most in has been when I've just stayed after class to talk to my professor, um, which I guess technically is an option over Zoom, but it kind of doesn't feel that way. Like that opportunity is just sort of gone and I can definitely feel the detriment this semester in like the two geology classes that I'm in that I really need to talk to my professor, but they're just kind of not available. And then like the extra hours that they have to put in kind of just limit their sort of just like emotional energy to be there to answer your questions or to go off on a tangent and expand your knowledge base, which is totally valid, like 100% valid, but it's still really sad. <laughs> So I have one more question um, I want to add. What advice would you give to students um, balancing research and academics? I always tell my students schoolwork comes first. Um, it doesn't matter how much work you've done in a lab if you have a lousy GPA. Um, you're, you're un unfortunately, the way that things work with admissions, they look, they've got to cut the stack somewhere and that often ends up with GPA being the first on the chopping block. So 
I all I always with my undergrads, if it's, you know, even if they're, you know, funded or if they are volunteering or if they're taking it for credit or whatever, whatever they might be doing to be involved in undergrad research, if they've got a big exam or maybe five, not five, like three or four in one week and they're getting slammed, they can always come to me and say, Sarah, I'm slammed. And I, can I skip my shift this week? Or can I, you know, can I compensate some other way when I, you know, come up for air? And I try to foster an environment where I, I, I want them to know that academics comes first. So that's my approach. Some faculty might feel like their research programs come first, but I think, I think as, as, as beneficial as it is, I think personally and professionally that undergrad research should, should be supplemental to the work that you're doing that ends up showing up in GPA and, you know, coursework performance. I would, I, I would agree. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I actually had the opportunity to interview one of the presidential doctoral research fellows. Um, so she's a, a doctorate student. Um, and I asked her the same question. I was like, a graduate degree is so difficult. I can't even imagine how you juggle these things. Cause she also had two kids at home and that blew my mind. How do you juggle research school, a family, having any personal time to yourself? How do you do this? And she gave me some really good advice. And she said, um, make a list of what is most like what your top three values are and make sure that in any aspect of your life, you're working towards those values. So if a value you have is getting a really um, comprehensive ed education, maybe um, focusing heavily on education, like Dr. Freeman said, while still seeing how you can enhance your education through your research would match that value. Or if your value is staying mentally and physically healthy at this time, make sure to cut back and give yourself the space that you need to cope with what you need to cope with and just take the time that you need to take care of yourself. It just kind of depends on what your values are at the moment and what you have capacity for emotionally, mentally, educationally. It's a lot and it's hard and it takes some time to figure out what those values are and how much capacity you have. But I think it's really helped me to take that advice that she gave me and sit down and write down my values and, and figure out what's super important to me what's kind of important to me and what I'm just doing because I think I have to and and cut out some of those things. Like just because I have to do it doesn't mean that I actually have to do it. Um, like focus on things that genuinely matter to me. That way I enjoy my time a lot more. I would say one of the um, biggest things for me was going into a project and not understanding how much time was actually going to be required from that project. Um, so I think being able to communicate with your mentor or advisor or the faculty member that you're working with and both of you having a clear understanding of what those boundaries are going to be and, um, and how much is expected of you, like how many hours a week are you planning on putting towards this project? Because um, my experience was kind of just going in blind and winging it, um, which sort of worked, but also I think I could have avoided a lot of really stressful situations, especially around exams, <laughs> uh, if I'd had a little bit more of a plan in place and more of an understanding of what my project was going to be or what was going to be required of. Yeah, I'll just add, I think that um, an open dialogue uh, with your mentor is very important. Uh, and I get all excited at group meeting about a, a set of experiments and I want Emily and Anthony to be doing those experiments this week because I'm really excited. And after group meeting, they come up to me and say, oh, we have a big biophys exam on Thursday. Can, can we wait until next week to do those? Absolutely, you, but you have to communicate with me. Um, so I, I, I think most professors would be fine with that. Well, I don't want to keep anybody over the, the hour that everybody committed to. Um, I know that I've noticed something that's also very easy to do on Zoom, to just stay chatting. Um, I'm often, I often find myself talking way longer than I should on Zoom, so I don't want to keep anybody here. 
if there's no more questions or no more comments, I think we're good to go ahead and wrap this up. Does anyone else have any any last thing they wanted to say before we're done tonight? Can I say something that is not research related, but very important? Absolutely. Tomorrow's November 3rd. If you haven't voted, make your plan, go vote. The polls close tomorrow night. <laughs> That is very important. Well, I know just on behalf of the College of Science and all the Science Council, we want to thank everybody here tonight for participating, for coming. Um, a special thank you to the panelists. We really do appreciate that you were willing to take time out of your Monday night, especially now that it seems so dark, it seems so late, um, to come and provide advice to hopefully freshmen. We're really excited to get this posted, hopefully allow a lot of people a chance to see this. And hopefully we'll see some some improvements. We'll get some, some of the faculty might be getting some professionally persistent emails. So our fingers are crossed. Thank you again. Thanks to everyone who helped set this up. I know the 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 council or the science council did a really good job getting this put together and it, it couldn't have been possible without the work of quite a few people. So thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, to any of us on this meeting. You can reach out to the science council. I know uh, Amelia and the the College of or the Office of Research would, would love to assist in getting people with some, some research opportunities. So thank you so much and I hope everyone has a fantastic night. Thank you.